What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Rams Brothers the Pod. I'm your host, Dean, and I'm joined by my brother and the other host of this show, Nick. And Nick, Super Bowl is over. The season is over. Defensive coordinator position is finally being locked in, potentially. But first and most importantly, how are you, my brother? Oh, I'm good. I'm good. I got to watch the game last night with some actual Eagles fans, which is always really fun when you get to watch the Super Bowl. People have stakes in it. And I got to watch the energy force of the room just get sucked from all the Eagles fans' bodies, which was a sad sight to see. And it felt like I almost stepped into an alternate universe where that was me last year, where the Rams lost. But nope, Rams are, you know, they were champs up until yesterday, but they'll never take that season away from us. And, you know, the Eagles going through all that, that whole year, all that stuff just to make it to that point and lose just proves how hard it is to win one of these things. That's I think that's kind of the moral of the story. Yeah. I got to watch with uh, our poppy, our grandfather, for those who don't know the term poppy. Um, he is a, a forever Eagles fan. He's watched four Super Bowl bowls in total, 1980, 2004, 17, and then this past one. So I was happy that I finally got a chance to watch it with him, but he was of the understanding that this is the best Eagles team he's ever seen. Right. And this is, you know, he's born in 1940. So he's seen 82 years of Eagles football. And for him to say that this is one of the best teams that he's seen and he appreciates the leadership from Jalen Hurts and everything else that the coach has done for the city. And uh, the way that I think they go about their business is very representative of the city in total. And uh, my poppy is one of the hardest workers that I think we uh, have ever known and have ever met. So with that being the case, getting to watch the game with him, I thought was really interesting. But, you know, you kind of felt the air starting to get sucked out after the second half. And a lot of our conversation kind of stemmed around how do you when you come out firing, when you come out with a 10 point lead at half, when you come out dominating time of possession, how do you handle the adversity of having to deal with Rihanna and the conditions on the field and going against your former coach? And all of the factors and storylines that came into play in this game, which is why I think it was such a great Super Bowl, aside from the fact that the game was decided at the end by potentially a referee. But, it, you know, the, it all came out. Bradbury came out and admitted that he got a tug of the jersey. History repeats itself, right, Nick? I'm sure you remember the holding call from last year on the linebacker that was pulling Cooper Cup's jersey down in the red zone. When people joke, they say the Rams were on sixth and goal, meaning that they had six chances to score to win the game. That's how hard it is to win. That's how hard it is to win the Super Bowl, though, right? You need a couple of extra chances. You need a a ball to bounce your way. Um, But just a blast in total to think the season all in all was a a very fun watch. Yeah, I mean, you could say it came down to one call. You listen to any of the Eagles fans post game. They're like, yeah, one call does not make a game. I held them, you know. Grass was slippery. It was slippery for both of us. It's like if you're Mm -hmm. playing Smash Brothers and items are on. The items are there for everybody, you know. It's <laughs> just have to know how to use the game here. Yep. yep. The, the, the long or the short form of the story is they lost, plain and simple. They were not the better team that that day. But I mean, the argument is made that they were the best team in the NFL that year, and they just didn't have what it takes to get over the Mahomes hump, which is you know quite a tough one to to overcome. I mean, honestly, though, like. I don't know if I love the direction of the team and where they're potentially heading with, with all, you know, releasing all the free agents and losing coordinators and, you know, like Hertz signing a potentially huge bag. I will bet on Jalen Hurts having a fantastic career. That was up there with the greatest Super Bowl quarterback performances I've ever seen in my life. Uh, three yeah. rushing touchdowns. He <laughs> completes the octopus which I called in a text, Dean, maybe show the text on the screen. Will there be an octopus was plus 1400. I had no idea what the hell that was until you explained it to me. So appreciate you. I explained it to you and I said, the Eagles are going to do it and it's going to be Hertz on both. So, you know, well, credit done. where credit is due. I'll take no, it. No, but you're right. It's, it's kind of the moral of the story. And the moral of this episode is it's how difficult it is to win. Everything needs to be perfect in a situation where Mahomes is and the Chiefs are kind of taking over the league, similar to how the Patriots did when they were around. And, and you know, that's what's so important. This is all the things that need to go right when you have a Super Bowl roster. This is from Elliot Shore Parks. He's a beat writer for the Eagles. I'm just going to read off this tweet. The 2022 Eagles went 16 and two fully healthy. They were fully healthy in the Super Bowl. All 22 starters were ready to play in that game. They were the number one seed. They got the MVP quarterback play. They were very healthy all throughout the season. They had a historic pass rush. And um, 
it got Love about that. as easy as as a path as it could have been to go to the Super Bowl into the playoffs. Uh, you know, fairly easy schedule, although it turned out not to be so easy. But they were up ten nothing at halftime of the Super Bowl, and they still didn't get the job done. So everything yeah. needs to be perfect. You need the pass rush to be able to be married with everything that's happening behind you, and the offense needs to be firing on all cylinders. If one little piece is missing, that Super Bowl trophy doesn't go home with you. I think one of the biggest takeaways, and this is like if you're a gambler, I think you know this already, but I'm going to just say it out loud. When it seems too easy, it always is. Nothing, especially in football, is mm -hmm. like worth achieving is ever going to be easy. And the Eagles, they had an easy schedule. You know, at the start of the season, it looked like projected the easiest schedule. They get the bye. I mean, those last couple of games, you know, Minshew comes in and they lose. It doesn't really even matter. Right. Um, they get the bye. They play a divisional Giants team who was, you know, already ahead of where they should have been, smoked them at home. And then they get third string Niners, but to their credit, they knock out the third string quarterback and force a fourth string in there. But I mean, they were bedridden. Like they, they could not be in that game because they didn't have the personnel and like, you know, the depth to stay in it. And then you get to a Super Bowl on your own neutral turf and you know, you're up 10 and a half and you think, you know, life is golden and it seems too easy. And lo and behold, it ends up being too easy. So it's just a little advice, I think, where if things are looking like so perfect, you have to face adversity to win a Super Bowl. Because without that, you can't be in those moments and you can't know how to take yourself out. As soon as the Eagles were trailing, I mean, they were able to come back. But as soon as they were trailing, it did really feel like all the steam was released from everything that they had. And then last year, look at the Rams, you know, obviously the Cardinals game was just a bowl over, but then they had to deal with um, the Bucks coming all the way back 27, three yep. and then winning that game with like 10 seconds left. And then coming back 10, a uh, uh, 20 to 10 in the third and fourth quarter of the NC championship. And then at the very end, the final moments of that game of the Super Bowl. Stafford and Cup have been there before and they're able to make those plays to inevitably have the game winning drive. So you have to have faced adversity to win a Super Bowl. And that would that's was the only thing that was really lacking in the Eagles. They never had those big moments where they had to step up. Yeah, and that was my fear before I even started watching the game was if the Eagles are down by 10 points, by 14 points, have they had enough experience this season with this group to be able to come back? And yeah. that wasn't even a question. The offense was firing on all cylinders in every occasion. I thought they were great. I thought Jalen was perfect. And there's a ton of credit that that deserves to go to Andy Reid. But, you know, how do you like how do you deal with adversity? How do you how do you deal with a team that loses four straight games in November? How do you deal with losing a starting safety and you know, not having a consistent running game and your quarterback's all banged up. Like there's so many moving pieces and it's almost impossible when to get everything perfect, to be able to put together the perfect Super Bowl roster. The, the level of difficulty is, is so high. So it's, it's almost like if you have a quarterback on a rookie contract and you're able to get there with core pieces, Kelsey, Mylotta, Lane Johnson, Brandon Graham, like they had everybody that they needed to have on that roster in order to get another Super Bowl under their belt. And it just doesn't always fall that way. And that's what's so difficult about it. And you really like talked about a historic pass rush. This was the historic pass rush. This is what wins you Super Bowls. The combination yeah. of Von Miller and Aaron Donald and Leonard Floyd. Like that's an Ashawn Robinson, who is, I, I hope, a priority in terms of a re-sign for the Rams. Because he's not only a great run stopper, but he also has the ability to rush the passer and, and, and wreck games. And you need as many guys like that on the roster. Robert Quinn for example, was a guy, fourth round pick they traded for him. And it's everybody was like, oh, the Bears got, you know, the Bears got screwed. It's like, no, you got a fourth round pick back. And I think Robert Quinn had two tackles, no pressures, no sacks in his time with the Eagles, I think over six or seven weeks. So you need everything to just be absolutely perfect. And I think that there were moments in that game where the Eagles defensively just let their foot off the gas. I think if Jonathan Gannon is going to go and get a head coaching job in Arizona, they're going to have to reevaluate what they did on the defensive side of the ball in the second half of that game. Because not only were they highly penalized, they made mistakes, crucial personnel mistakes, but you have to be able to force in any in any means necessary, whether it's a, a, a different kind of blitz, something that's intricate, 
you know, whatever it may be that could get the quarterback off of his spot, you got to be able to get Mahomes off of his spot. You got to be able to force him to fumble or throw an interception down the stretch. And yeah. you can't do that without an elite top level pass rush, Hall of Fame guys. They Fletcher, have Cox, Nick, Fletcher Cox, half the player of what Aaron Donald is. Yeah. Okay. And, I, I, and Reddick is now, he's no Von Miller, but they had, you know, they thought they had enough to get the job done. Everybody would have thought they had enough to get the job done going. They into did. That game. Yeah, they did. I mean, I think there was a little, should I say, Ewing theory with the Chiefs offensive line because I it felt like nobody believed in them at in that moment that, you know, it was like everybody's talking, you know, Reddick, Super Bowl MVP and whatnot. But I mean, up until that game, they were dominant. Like it felt like they couldn't not get like seven sacks. They were just on top of it the whole time. They and then were. I guess the moment was a little too big and those Chiefs offensive linemen just used everything that they had. But also credit to um, Andy Reid designing a game plan that allows the ball to come out of Patrick Mahomes' hands fast, which, you know, that was how the Bills beat us week one this year. Uh, and, and many teams, Jimmy G. Yeah, the 49ers yeah, have sliced and diced yep. this up mm-hmm. in a couple of years. It's yep. Get the ball out, out of his hands early, quick passes. Don't let the pass rush even be a factor. And but also, it, also be able to marry the run with yeah. that, right? Because that's yeah. what Andy Reid, I think, was able to do so well in this oh game. Oh, my God. That's, Pacheco. That's, uh, yeah, that's why he's a future hall. Pacheco just runs with – like he's from New Jersey or something. I know um, that <laughs> – you know, part of the Mahomes legacy and like, you know, he did everything he could in that game to like, you know, you know, win it, win it for them. I'm watching that game and I'm like, Pacheco seems to be the most valuable player. I, that was just my opinion. Yeah. In that game. It, it seemed like he yeah. was a part of almost every huge important play that wasn't one of those throwing touchdowns. Oh, he sure was. Yeah, I mean, he kept them in the. I mean, the time of possession was so lopsided in the first half, but you saw that he had they enough stuck energy to the run. They could trust to be, him exactly to be so able to huge. sustain it. Yeah. Yep. In the second half, and that's what Andy Reid. So, like, that's what I thought was so special about this game for Andy Reid. Because if you look back at the parallels, Andy Reid has really had his fingerprints all, all over the last four Eagles or three Eagles Super Bowls. 2004, he was the head coach. 2017, he had his understudy Doug Peterson coach that roster, and Nick Foles had the best quarterback performance historically in Super Bowl history. And then again, you got to go up against them. But Sirianni was another guy, was another disciple that got fired by Andy Reid and found his own way and worked his way up with Indianapolis. But like the criticism with Andy Reid always in Philadelphia was the lack of commitment to the run game. There was always a lack of balance. He was pass happy. He never could commit to the run despite having personnel up front. Eagles from 2000 to 2000, and I'd say 12 or so, had just an elite, elite, elite offensive line. And if you go look, John Runyon and Trey Thomas, some of these guys are, are unanimous Hall of Famers. And when you go back and look at what Andy Reid did in this game, and I thought when you're able to flip a narrative on a city's head like that, and he never seemed to panic, he was perfectly balanced. It was 26 runs to 27 passes. That's how picture perfect, right down the middle, balanced he was. And in the red zone, the art of misconception, running the same play twice, but having players move and come in motion, and you're giving off the same looks, Nick. It's exactly what you'd want to see from an offense. They who did was the ring around the Rosie. Rosie. Yeah, you. It, <laughs> there's so many different bags of tricks. Of one play, Andy Reid called corn dog, and he said it's because he loves to put mustard and ketchup on the corn dog. And the, the, you know, the two receivers split out opposite sides. And that's one of the play calls in the red zone is like everybody's of an understanding that there's there's symbolism, there's personality, there is there's passion. And this guy is a, a surefire Hall of Famer, one of the best five coaches in the history of the league. It's Bill Belichick and Don yeah. Shula and George Hallis and Andy Reid. I think he wants his third. He wants to get his third. And then I think he can eat a cheeseburger in paradise after that. <laughs> Yeah, cheeseburger. He likes jalapeno on the to pepper jack cheese. I mean, that's that's what you are when you're he's talking about how the enemy writes some notes on the wrappers of the cheeseburger for when he opens it up like this. It is a for the league. It's exactly who you'd want to be in that position. And I think when you watch it with somebody like Poppy, 
going back to him for a second, who has all this perspective. So Dick Vermeil versus Tom Flores, Jaws versus Jim Plunkett in 1980 and 2004 last second field goal. I remember him going crazy over T.O. because T.O. had screws in his ankles coming off of a five week leg injury. I think he broke his leg, got screws, went for 122 yards like what Philadelphia does in the Super Bowl is consistently entertaining. And I think for oh, how yeah. great Andy Reid is. And that was how great my takeaway, too. Yeah, how great Andy Reid is, how great Mahomes is going to be for the face of, the, of this league and for the sake of, of carrying on Tom Brady's legacy. It's a true passing of the torches from Jordan to LeBron. Like that comparison is now able to be made in this league because you have somebody like Mahomes and Andy Reid. But on the other side, the running quarterback has has evolved and has shown you that you could be MVP caliber. You could you could throw for 300 yards and a touchdown and run for three in the same Super Bowl and have an MVP season right behind the next best. So, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of good stuff I think that came out of that game and for yeah. for both franchises. Really, one of my takeaways was the credit to Philadelphia because when they're in when they are in the Super Bowl, it is a party. I mean, yeah. on the field and off. I think they flipped that Toyota Corolla a little too early. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, Nick Foles, Super Bowl, Donovan McNabb, and then now this one. Those are some of the best television that you're going to get. And, that you know, that is just awesome that Philly kind of represents that. They're going to be loud. They're going to be bombastic. That's, that's how the city is. So that I thought that was really, really, really great. Um, and then uh, the brother dynamic, Nick, how about this little send off? Yeah. Fuck you. Congratulations. That is an older brother to a younger brother. 10 times out of 10. You always bet on the younger brother when you have the opportunity. <laughs> they, well, they will always come through for you back against the wall. Younger brother is going to win. Eli want to know in the pro bowl. Yeah. Tra Travis Kels want to know against his brother, Jason Kelsey in the Super Bowl. Yeah, I know. I know what it's like. What about Coach O'Shea and his brother? Danny wanna O'Shea, want to know. <laughs> and what the hell was I was going to say the bourbon bowl, but that's the water boy. Uh, Urbania. I don't know what it's called. Urbania I think it's just like a, was the I thought it was just like a regular season game. Yeah, well, they were competing to see who gets into the league. Oh, right. Yeah, which, uh, you know, that's where the story leaves off. You know, maybe me and you keep, uh, keep the pens going and, and write the second part. Yeah. Should we look Maybe. at my picks for the Super Bowl? Yeah, let's pull up your picks for the Super Bowl. So All the right. First so, one so what I did we have? What was three weeks in the making? So I had, I had a Chiefs to win the Super Bowl three weeks ago. I, I, I put that in. So if you were following at home, Chiefs to win the Super Bowl, and then we hedged with this bet, which was over forty three and a half and Eagles plus five teaser. So then that way, if the Eagles won, we were fine either way. And lo and behold, both bets seemed to hit. The Chiefs won, the over hit, and the Eagles covered plus five. So we were in the ideal sweet spot. We hit the big Super Bowl bet. We hit the over tees. We found the little middle spot. It was, it was fantastic. Um, and then I convinced my girl to, to do – because she's from Vineland, where Isaiah Pacheco is from, the New Jersey. And she also went to Rutgers like him. And, she, you know, I was like, hey, maybe we sprinkle some money on the Pacheco anytime touchdown score. And she was like, he just has to score anytime? And I was like, yeah, that's all he's got to do. She was like, okay, let's do it. So then there it is. That was a bet I advised you to take as well. So right now we are just flying high. We're shining bright like, like diamonds. We're thinking Umbrella's going to hit. First song, no. What was the first song? Can you remind Bitch, me? Bitch, better have my money. <laughs> Pay me what you want it. Like, Damn. Oh, I wanted to just see the pa, pa, like under my no, umbrella. No, I mean, Too bad. ballsy move. I should have thought, Rihanna, because most people, like, Coldplay is going to go with, Dun, 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 you rule? Like Viva the only song people know, but Rihanna's yeah. got hit after hit. So she wanted to come out with a little more, you know, kick assery. So I applaud the bitch better have my money. I thought we were going to go run this town, to be honest. Oh, that was cool. Something good to, something good to kick us off. But she, and then what else what? did I say? She paid played like eight songs. They were all great. Yeah. All great. Well, she's got like 20 hits. 
It's got too many hits. What well, else did I you said, have? I, I think I said red Gatorade to Cornside with the, the Chiefs, which was an yeah. L. Without the knowledge that the previous Gatorade color when Andy Reid won last time was orange, which mm -hmm. didn't play into account. No, whatsoever. purple. Purple hit it like <laughs> plus 700. We haven't seen purple in years. I don't even know they still sold purple Gatorade. I actually took Good. a prop bet. I took um at plus 17,000. I took Tiger Woods green Gatorade. You remember that one? That was an option? No. no I'm oh. I was going to say that <laughs> there was, was like discontinued in 2008. Oh my God. It was like the best Gatorade ever. And it that's wasn't why I like, that's why I like propel. It was the same color as the cucumber Gatorade now, which is horrible. Oh, yeah, but hard. it was this like I couldn't I can't even describe the taste, almost like dragonberry. And I then they pulled it the from the shelves because he had like seven cheating scandals. It was such <laughs> bullshit. It was like right the best wife, of all time. Right after the wife took a bat to the car and took the kids, I think that was when the Gatorade was discontinued. Yeah, Tiger still still the goat. Uh, maybe not so in good. that in that regard. But we I think you give the purple get that back. Give the purple another shot. Spike, yeah. he's pretty good. Spike, that purple Gatorade. I think you give it another shot. And then your last bet was, uh, was there another? Yeah, Rihanna's first. Oh, night. you had Miles. Oh no, this Miles is even touchdown parlayed with Travis Kelsey touchdown. Yeah, that the only one. Did Gainwell score? I thought get no Gainwell didn't score. He no, didn't score. you're missing one bet, and it was the plus nine hundred odds. Oh yeah, team, team flop. flop, team, team flop. flop pulled it out last minute. Uh, Moo Cow scores one in uh, at the buzzer. It was pretty, I mean, it was fantastic. It was <laughs> For those who cool. watched the Puppy Bowl and had money on Team Fluff, congratulations. You are a winner. Um, Nick, next year's Super Bowl odds. Tell me if you believe oh, they're already this. up. They're already up. I'm going to read them from the top. Chiefs, number one, plus 600. Buffalo Bills, plus 850. Eagles, plus 900. Bengals, plus 900. Niners, plus 900 Cowboys plus 1500 Ravens plus 1600 Chargers plus 2000 Packers plus 2500 Jags plus 2500 Lions plus 2500 Jets plus 2500 and then there sits the Los Angeles Rams at plus 3000 I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you something right now the Rams have a better chance of winning the Super Bowl next year than the Jets the Lions, the Jags, the Packers, the Chargers, the Ravens, and the Cowboys. Uh, yeah, I, Cowboys would be the only one. Here's my thing, though. I see those odds, and I'm like, okay, Chiefs are plus 600. So that means I have $600 to place bets with because if the Chiefs win, you do 100 on the – just do 100 on the top – on, like, the top uh, six right there. And then if the Chiefs win, you're even money. But then if any of those other teams win, you're golden. I mean, I know yeah. there's the chance that, you know, like the Titans at plus 750 could have like an amazing year and like, you know, they pick up Rodgers somehow or something crazy happens. But, I mean, all those teams, those top teams, the Niners, the Bills, the Bengals, the, the you know, Eagles again, the Chiefs, they're probably going to be in the mix. So, I, I don't know. The, I mean, I feel like yeah. – like, People that are disciplined with their gambling, that's what they would do. Um, I also think the Lions are probably on par with the Rams right now. They one actually may the, be a little further and uh, further ahead. I think one of the things you have to take into account after you get past the divisional round and the championship round, or even if you if you made it that far, I think you have to take into consideration if your franchise has ever won a Super Bowl before. Because it seems like in these kind of moments, the team that has more experience – in every Super Bowl, year over year, the Bengals have been to three, lost them all. The Bills have been to so many and have lost them. If you have the experience of winning and getting over the top and not panicking in certain situations and knowing how to play from behind in crucial spots, those are the teams that continuously win Super Bowls. Like I felt like Andy Reid having the experience that he had in that late-game situation. He didn't panic, brought the clock all the way down to six seconds, kicked the field goal, squib kicked it, gave them one play left, and he managed the, the end of the game. The second half was perfect. After yeah. Mahomes only possessing the ball for seven and a half minutes. So I just think that, that that really matters. Coaching matters. Having the experience of getting the job done matters. And that's why I feel like the Rams have a better chance at any, than anybody who hasn't gone and won the Super Bowl yet.
Yeah, I mean, McVay, Donald, the uh, Cup, Stafford, everybody's coming back. We should be fine. And hopefully, be back. Know, all the injuries kind of hit us last year and we can come in strong this year. I, yeah, yeah, I mean, I like our chances next year. I like our chances to win the division. Uh, you know, it's going to be a tough, a tough outing, but we got our rough or defensive coordinator back. Yeah. So offensive coordinator is going to be Mike LaFleur. Obviously the tight ends coach is going to be Nick Cayley. The offensive line coach is going to be Ryan Wendell. And our defensive coordinator is going to be a name that we're all very familiar with in Raheem Morris. All right. Don't everybody clap at once. All right. He's coming back. Shane Steichen is going to go to the Indianapolis Colts. It hasn't been announced yet, but it seems like it's trending in that direction. It's going to happen very soon. So knowing that, Nick, it's exactly what we said in the previous episode was they were going to wait until after the Super Bowl. They felt like they were kind of leaning into, you know, the Eagles coordinator position in terms of a hire. And now it's going to be Shane Steichen and potentially Jonathan Gannon is going to go coach in Arizona, which is probably best case scenario for us Rams fans. We get the defensive coordinator that just allowed what he did in the second half of that game. To go to Arizona, great sign. But um, Raheem Morris coming back, being the defensive coordinator of the Rams, what's that? What does that mean? I think to to all Rams fans, it means that you're not losing any other coaches. You have a guy that in McVay's regime, it's almost unheard of to stick around for a third year. You know, it's almost guarantee that you're going to get a different job elsewhere, whether it's going to be a head coaching job in college, another coordinator position in the NFL, or a head coaching job in the NFL. Look at Thomas Brown. Specifically, he's getting offensive coordinator looks. Um, I, I'm trying to remember exactly who it was. I want to say the Panthers. No, the Panthers weren't one. He's getting they looked at. Maybe right, it was, right. Like, was it the Panthers and the Saints? I want to say it was two North teams that were looking at him. Maybe the Falcons were one. Um, but in that scenario, it, it's so crucial to be able to have some continuity with coordinators year over year. I don't know if this team looks much different with Kevin O'Connell at the helm from year over year. Instead of having Liam Cohn, who ended up going back to Kentucky, potentially you would have been in a much better position. But you know you can't you can't coach injured players when your personnel isn't the personnel you expected to be, and who you who you game planned with, and who you went through camp with. All that stuff crumbles at your wayside. You know who's to say anybody could actually do that job well? I think having Raheem back is just exactly what us Rams fans need. We need some year over year continuity. I think there's going to be some minor adjustments in terms of the bend, don't break. You saw it on display. You can't afford to be on your heels. You have to be willing to, t- to take risks and the blitz and, and to do things that are a little bit different and unorthodox and able to get in order to get to the quarterback and, and force the ball on the ground and force a turnover. Otherwise, you're going to find yourself all the way back in the big game and not being able to, to get it done in the end. So I'm happy he's back. And I'm, I can imagine that you are, too. It's funny. I looked at the last like seven to eight Super Bowl winners, and the only thing I was focusing on was the pass rush. And I was like, the team with the better pass rush wins. Always. Eight of the last seven, the team with the better pass rush won. Seven and of the that- last eight? <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry. No, did I say that wrong? Yeah, seven <laughs> of the last eight. And the one, the one outlier – was Kansas City against yeah. San Francisco. It was Mahomes. So I was telling all my Eagles fans, friends, I was like, guys, like, yes, they have the better pass rush, but the only time that didn't matter is when Mahomes was on the other end. And lo and behold, he's just he, – you just can't bet against them. You just can't do it. No, you can't. And you can't game plan against them either. You no. know, it's 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 – the best way to game plan against him is to be able to keep him off of the field. And that's yeah. what you do. That's what you do with Tom Brady. You A, have to keep him off of the field in the first half as long as you possibly can. And then B, you can't give him the final possession. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's the only way to do it. People were celebrating after the Eagles tied it up. And I was like, five minutes with Mahomes and you guys are celebrating? Like, you just got eight. They need three. So Right, right. It's tough. So happy. So grateful for Joe Burr and those Bengals for knocking them off last year. Yeah. I mean, that we, so obviously we lost the Super Bowl in 2018 to the Patriots. But um, I know we talked about in previous episodes that we feel like that Rams team would have been able to put up another 54 points against that Chiefs team. But yeah, narrowly avoided 
having to go up against Patrick Mahomes in two of the last five Super Bowls. Yeah. He's played in three, and the Rams have been in two of the last five. So Eagles have been in two of the last six. I yeah, think, uh, and funny, City. funny enough, it was the young coach and the inexperience that was the fault of both of those, both of those losing Eagles and Rams teams. Yeah, there's a lot of second year coaches, and McVay was one, right? He was in his second year in 2018 when he went back to the Super Bowl, went to the Super Bowl for his first time. Sirianni's in his second year. Ooh. Kyle Shanahan was in his second year. Like there's a when you Mike McDaniel, maybe he goes next year for the Dolphins. That's what I was about to say. I was gonna say maybe right now we put Dolphins win. Here's the prediction. Ready? Mm-hmm. Dan Campbell, Mike McDaniel, no, Campbell's, Campbell's third year. Yeah, right. I know. I'm trying to think of another guy that's in his uh, O'Connell. There we oh, go. Oh my God. Go that would Vikings. be an awesome Super Bowl. Vikings, Vikings Dolphins. Dolphins. And yeah. you know that you know the Vikings will lose. <laughs> No, see, like that's an impossibility in my brain because I've I've never seen it. Never seen the Miami Dolphins in a Super Bowl. Wasn't alive um, for the yeah. perfect season. All the Minnesota Vikings do is lose the divisional round or the, the NFC championship to the Eagles in the in Philadelphia, 37 to 3. So yeah, but there is a there is a phenomenon because two second year head coaches, three second year head coaches in the last five years have been to the Super Bowl. That's so, amazing. That's a yeah. really good stat that we yeah. just found. We just talked ourselves into it. We talked ourselves into that stat. We sure did. Hey, you know, that's what you do when you have 165 episodes of one single show. You eventually talk yourself into some smart ideas. And you're like 15 to 25 episodes removed of Rams football. Yeah, it's a little bit difficult. But um, I'm just happy over the fact that there are not additional coaches leaving. Because if you got it, this is it's more work for us, right? We get on the podcast, it's like, oh, four more deep dives of four new names that are coming in on the defensive side of the ball. Outside of that, it's going to be Raheem Morris potentially just bringing in defensive assistants, offensive assistants, linebacker coaches, defensive line coaches, secondary coaches. If Eric Yarber doesn't come back, right? Like, so there's there's guys in the Rams' pipeline who I think they're going to be able to try to promote. They're going to be be able to try and build up. You want to be able to build that same kind of sample size of success, what makes the the appeal to be able to come join the Rams' organization more enticing, more exciting year over year. If there's a guarantee that you're going to come in, work your ass off, and get to the next level, I, I don't think there's any reason why you wouldn't want that as a, as a competitive middle-aged guy, right? That's what everybody's looking for. Yeah. So um, I love that mentality. I, I, I do like Raheem Morris, and I think that the Ben don't break defense, I, I don't want to – like this is like – you know, it's it's something that is so sensitive to a lot of Rams fans, and I completely understand why. Because the bend don't break defense can lose you a Super Bowl. It's it's very real. It's very obvious. If the pass rush doesn't get home, there's so much pressure on the second and third levels of the defense to be able to consistently stick in coverage. And it's you know, and when you're accounting for a zone, and there's another guy that thinks they're responsible for another assignment, and it doesn't work out in your favor, that's when your defense gets in a ton of trouble. So. If, if this team doesn't come prepared with another high-caliber edge rusher, with a healthy Aaron Donald, with a re-signed Sean Robinson, potentially Greg Gaines coming back, with Michael Hoyt looking like J.J. Watt, then this team might be in trouble next year. And that's the, that's the sad reality. You're going to need somebody that's alongside of Jalen Ramsey. That's, you know, are you going to re-sign Troy Hill? Is the, the back end of your secondary, what are you going to do with Jordan Fuller? You know, does does rap come back? Does Nick Scott come back? I saw somebody talking about John Johnson on Twitter today. You know, are they going to pay a safety? Definitely not. The last one they paid is OJ Otagway. Wow. What that's a call. What a name. That's, drop. All, that's all I got. I mean, uh, th- th- you do. You ha- There's a lot of cleaning up to do. And I, I think that if you don't address that, then you're going to find yourself in similar positions. But I think a lot of that can get disguised by the Rams coming prepared with a solid offense, one that's comprehensive, one that has developed a stage further than what it was in 18 and 22 with Mike LaFleur and Sean McVay. So they're on that track. They're very much on that track. We will see how it all unfolds. We will see what other names come in. And Nick, really, I think that's all we got for uh, for the Rams fans today. Yeah. Um, next episode, Thursday, I'm going to announce a winner to the giveaway. So I'm giving people a little more time uh, to submit. If you want 
a LA Rams Super Bowl champions hat. Like, subscribe, tweet a picture to us that you're subscribed to our YouTube channel. And yeah, uh, don't forget also, bet online, live betting, free contests, giveaways all season long, always the fastest, always the easiest way to bet all your favorite sports and events, whether that's NFL, NBA, NHL, MMA, tennis, boxing, or even golf. I'm going to talk to them to see if they can get the XFL and the USFL on there. Ooh, no that. word yet. I'm hoping that they can. You're going to bet on Wade Phillips' is, uh, Houston Mountaineers, or whatever the hell they're called? Roughnecks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Um, head to betonline.ag to join and receive your 50% welcome bonus with your first deposit. Make sure to use our promo code BLEAV to receive your rewards. Bet online where the game starts, where the podcast ends. Dean, take us Nick, away. Nick, real quick, I want to make sure that people know what the, the giveaway rules are. So if if you're already subscribed to the podcast, thank you. We love you with our entire heart. But if you're already subscribed and you still want a hat, comment. Just a comment. Like and comment in our comment section. Dean's, Dean's changing the rules. And uh, no, just you know, for more entries, Nick, more entries. And then the other piece of it is, who is it just one giveaway? Are you going to give no, one hat? You're going to give ten hats to one guy. I'm just grabbing a hat so they know what's going to know. What Got it. Going. Got it. All right. I just wanted to make sure there was some criticism. The hats are on sale, but it's more fun to win it through a podcast. So uh, <laughs> wait, no just, way. People yeah, were saying there, that. There were comments. Don't worry. There's always a comment. What were they saying? Oh, you're giving away a hat that's I, on I sale. Buy, I could buy this online for six dollars. Is that how much it's going for right now? Uh, I, th I think they're about ten bucks. Wow! Right now. Well, you know so, what? Keep, then whoever commented that, keep then spend the six dollars. Then, all right, <laughs> loser. This is the hat. Look at that sticker. It says "On Field Headgear." You're not going to get that when you buy online, you dork. This is from the game. I, you know what? I don't even want to do this giveaway, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> what, a, what an ass. I'm sorry. What an ass. Yeah, if you want to be a part of, of the movement, just uh, like, subscribe, and comment. And you're in the entry for a new hat. And Nick has disappeared on me again. I was probably going to say, is, sorry. Yeah, it's all right. It's all right. We got Mario Golf in the background. That's all that matters. Yeah. Thanks, we love guys. you guys. Thank you guys for listening. We appreciate you. Peace. Go Rams. Talk to you in a couple of days. Yeah. <laughs>